Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. I have just a couple of announcements to start with. First of all, uh, tomorrow on Wednesday, April 24th, Wellness 101 uh, Introduction to Plant-Based Nutrition conference call takes place, 90 minutes and just full of information on understanding this diet and how to adopt it. So if you're a new member and you haven't taken this class yet, I strongly suggest it. Get some good tips on how to get off to a good start. And then I'm really excited about this. On um, April 25th, uh, Shannon Kulik is going to be talking about um, this book, Wheat Belly. I don't know about you, but I'm so sick and tired of answering questions about this silly book. And so one of our best little analysts has taken the time to read the book and analyze what the guy says. And she has some comments about it. She'll take questions about it. So um, I think it should be very, very interesting. And we're going to do some more of that in the coming months. We're going to look at some of these books and diets that are attract a lot of attention and I know drive a lot of you crazy and give you some information on how you can talk to other people about this kind of thing. So I have a couple things to talk about today and one of them is type 2 diabetes um, which we have so much of in this country and because our approach is to manage the diabetes which causes the diabetic to get worse um, and then uh, a lot of them take multiple drugs they'll start out on metformin for example but as their disease progresses they end up taking insulin in addition to their uh, other drugs and a new study highlights the dangers of taking insulin um, and I think most people think that insulin and saves lives and boy for type 1 diabetics it certainly does but it's not so much the case for type 2 diabetes. Researchers in the UK looked at the medical records of over 84,000 type 2 diabetics and reported that insulin increased the risk of having a major cardiac event developing cancer and early death by 80 percent. That's a pretty big number. Insulin also close to doubled the risk of heart attack and more than doubled the risk of developing neuropathy as compared to those who only took metformin. Now I'm no great fan of metformin and my contention is we can get rid of the diabetes, but that's beside the point. The point is that taking insulin because your diabetes has progressed is a very risky proposition. So why are these diabetics taking insulin? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the advice that these diabetics get is to, um, is to eat animal foods, low-fat low protein like animal foods and dairy, and, and many times to avoid healthy plant foods like potato and corn, uh, potatoes and corn. So what happens is while they continue to consume this awful diet, they gain weight, the drugs help them to gain weight, um, and diabetics store intramyocellular fat which gets up into the cells and actually makes the cells more insulin resistant. So as the disease progresses, pretty soon metformin isn't enough and lo and behold we have to add insulin to the mix because um, the diabetes requires more drugs in order to remain under control. And there we have the increased disease risks that I mentioned earlier. Now, what's so frustrating about this, actually it's not frustrating, we just need to have more people know about it, is that type 1 and type 2 diabetics get better on a low-fat plant-based diet. Insulin needs can be reduced by as much as 40% for a type 1 diabetic, and many times the disease can be completely placed into remission for type 2 diabetics. And um, if you read Neil Barnard's book on this, uh, you, you see how easy it is to get these kinds of results. So, you know, one of the things I'm starting to talk about more and more is the informed consent discussion. Why are we not sitting down with people and saying, look, you have type 2 diabetes. Now, there are a couple of different directions we can go here. I can put you on metformin, just to take a drug, I'm not picking on that particular one, there are others too. I can put you on metformin and you can follow some you know, basic dietary advice. It doesn't work, you're gonna gain weight, your diabetes will get worse, eventually you're gonna take insulin. And as your diabetes progress, you're at high risk for blindness and stroke and coronary artery disease. In fact, that's what most diabetics die from. And uh, kidney failure resulting in the need for dialysis or transplant and neuropathy and amputa amputation and sometimes even death. So that's what we can do, or we could adopt a whole foods plant-based diet, and if you're uh, like most people, your body will respond to it, and if you're type 1 diabetic, we'll reduce your medication, but type 2 diabetics, you may even find that you put your disease in remission. Why aren't we having that discussion? Um, and I think if we started having that discussion in doctor's office, offices, lots of people would opt for the, the diet. So anyway, things are worse for type 2 diabetics than most of them know. Now, the other thing I want to talk about today is kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, one of my favorite quotes from John McDougall in The Starch Solution is, your personal choices are not so personal. That's a direct quote. 
People who say, well, I can eat whatever I want. I can do whatever I want because it's my body and I can eat what I want and I pay the price if I'm overweight or I'm sick or you know I end up disabled or um, anything like that. It's, it's my body and I can do with it what I want. Well, this kind of stuff is really starting to irritate me and it's taken me, it's taken me a very long time to be willing to come forth and talk about this, but I know what I'm talking about because my mother died last year after many years of awful eating, smoking, living a sedentary life, all the while telling everybody it's my body and I can do whatever I want to. And I watched my family become more and more consumed by her illness, particularly my sister and my father. And all of us, including you and I as taxpayers, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars taking care of her in her declining state of health. I don't think her personal choices were so personal, were they? Well, a recent article quantified just how expensive today's obesity epidemic has become to the public. The public is you and I, the taxpayers. We're paying the bill. So according to this article, we spend $190 billion per year on added medical costs due to obesity-based health complications. The average obese American spends significantly more for medications for, uh, for prescription drugs than non-obese people. The average American does not absorb this cost alone, however. Insurance companies and the government are all subsidizing this. Back to you and I paying for these drugs, increased cost of drugs for obese people. Now this is interesting. Increased fuel costs for cars add another $3.4 billion to the obesity tab. Fuel costs are higher when you are an obese person or a whole family of obese persons driving a car. For the airlines, the tab is an extra billion dollars, and, and that's 350 million gallons of extra fuel that the airlines have to consume every year to fly so many overweight people where they're going. And of course, that's another thing you and I absorb because we're all buying airline tickets and paying higher prices for them. Obese people are less productive at, their, at work than their normal weight counterparts, which according to the Society of Actuaries costs $164 billion worth of lost productivity. Absenteeism due to obesity, $6.4 billion. Childhood obesity, $14.3 billion, and Medicare and Medicaid spend $62 billion on obesity-related costs. Now, I've run all those numbers by you, and if you add them up, they're disastrous. And according to researchers at Columbia University, if things don't change, those numbers will be even higher very soon. In fact, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation expects that by 2030, loss of productivity will hit $580 billion due to obesity. That alone. As for the report that things are getting better, which we occasionally hear, Colorado has the best obesity rates in the whole country, 20.7% of the population. That's as good as it gets, and it's higher than the worst state was 20 years ago. That was and still is Mississippi. Uh, so in Colorado, we have a million overweight and obese people, and that's the very best place in the country. Now, I have a lot of compassion for obese people. Um, I've had such personal experiences with Dell in our office who came here weighing 500 pounds and has lost um, almost over half of his body weight now. And I know from dealing with him and many other people that people who are obese are miserable. They're sick. They suffer from horrendous self-esteem issues that I wouldn't wish on anybody. But I really think it's time for everybody who's sick and obese to say, look, I should want to take responsibility for my body. But aside from all of that, I have some personal responsibility to the society in which I live to not become a financial burden to my family, to my friends, to the taxpayers of America. I can tell you, I think one of the worst outcomes I can think of for myself would become be becoming a burden to my family and friends as I age, and I'm intent on not doing it. Um, so the personal decisions, actually not so personal after all. And um, a friend of mine told me uh, a week ago, we were chatting about this very issue, and she said one of the things that she tells people is the best gift you can give your family and friends is to take care of yourself so they don't have to. All right, that's all for now. As always, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday.